So we are seeing a rise in frequency of extreme weather events, you know, floods, landslides, drought, uh, and that is imposing increasing costs on economies, especially on smaller island nations. You know, it's devastating. The cost can be very large. So I think everybody agrees that there is, we don't have luxury of time to wait to fix the problems. There's going to be investment that's needed in adaptation and in mitigation of climate change. You know, that, the good thing is everybody is on board with that. Countries have set goals in terms of what they hope to uh, accomplish in terms of reaching the levels uh, that are in line with the Paris Agreement. The problem is there's one, not enough ambition in terms of those goals. And secondly, there is a bit of a, there's a disconnect between even the stated ambition and what is being done in terms of actual policy actions. So to your question of what countries need to do, I think they need to close both those gaps, which is make much more concerted effort on the policy end and also in terms of raising their ambition because otherwise we are going to fail as, as a planet uh, in terms of preserving this, this planet that we have. Now, you know, the, the, if you look at the costs of doing all of that, that is very high. Like I said, you know, some of these numbers are in, incredibly high. For emerging and developing economies, again, you're looking at about spending of $2 trillion a year for both adaptation and mitigation. Those are very large numbers. So I think what is important is to recognize, firstly, that this cannot be done by the public sector alone, by far. I think at best 20% is public sector. The remaining has to be done by the private sector, because otherwise you cannot sustain this in fiscally uh, countries. What does that mean in terms of policy measures? It means that you have to have a comprehensive package that in addition to you know, building green investment and green infrastructure, you also need to have carbon pricing as a part of it. Because carbon pricing provides the signals to the private sector about the direction in which uh, we are headed. And also it helps in terms of revenues for the government. And that's critical because it's important to have what we call a, a just transition. And North South Africa is also thinking uh, imp uh, 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 along those exact lines, which is you need to have for it to be socially sustainable, this, kind, this green transition, you have to have the revenues that you can provide because you will need compensatory measures. You will need to reskill workers to match them to uh, new jobs. I mean, our assessment is that the number of green jobs that can be created will be greater than the number of brown jobs that are lost. The risk, of course, is of skill mismatch and not being able to get workers in that particular sector. So a, a comprehensive package that involves carbon pricing so that it's fiscally sustainable and that you can have the revenues for it to be socially sustainable, I think are both uh, very important. If you look at uh, the carbon intensity of GDP for South Africa, that is one of the highest in the world. So which means that the transition is going to be particularly difficult because you're saying that you want to change the, uh, you know, the, you're going to reduce the carbon intensity of your GDP quite dramatically uh, and that's going to impact sectors and jobs in large numbers. So this is, uh, this is particularly high, uh, in, in a particularly high, tough challenge for South Africa. The, you know, the government clearly recognizes issues, it designed a policy that can help in terms of the just uh, transition framework that they have. It's going to, of course, be important to implement it and make that transition happen. It's costly. Uh, on the positive side, recently, uh, the, you know, the Paris summit, you had uh, partners of South Africa, including the US, the European Union, Germany, France, UK, who uh, provided funding, I think around eight and a half uh, billion, to support this just transition framework. That is very welcome and that's helpful. But there's a whole lot more money if you're that's needed, right, compared to, to that number. So this goes back to the question of making sure that you improve the efficiency of your spending so that you can redirect your revenues to, uh, you know, to help with the climate transition. In terms of the uh, 
uh, IMF, we have, we've done several things. I mean, climate was not a big part of the IMF's uh, work agenda in the past, but that has changed in these past years, given how critical it is to the health of a macro uh, economy. We have in place a, a financing facility, it's called the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, that we use to be able to provide funding to countries on a long-term basis, actually, which is, again, something we did not do in the past, to help with their climate strategies. We have about 10 countries that have been approved by the board to do that, and I believe there are four countries on the African continent. There are about 40 countries that are also eager to get that support. So we are helping in, in that in terms of financing, but we're also helping in terms of advice on what kinds of policies are going to be more effective than the others, how to include climate financing in your budgeting, and also to be ready for the fact that you might have a climate disaster and you have to prepare, and you would, you're going, that can affect your budgets. So going into, uh, into all of that. And lastly, again, you know, coming back to the point that this is not something that can be done only through the public sector or through multilateral institutions. We need the private sector to play a very important role.